Audrey, who is from Berkeley, uh, he was also in private practice before working with CBD in environmental and civil rights litig litigation. And I think that's something that some of us have not always, I think more now, we're keeping in mind that it's not just the environment and conservation, it's social justice, environmental justice as well. Uh, I just wanted to, some of Brendan's noteworthy uh, cases that he's worked on successfully, I just Again, it's, it's marvelous that the work that he's done through CBD for the world. Uh, protecting polar bears under the ESA, a ban on oil leasing on all public lands in California, the uh, prohibition of uh, ORVs in various riparian areas around our desert, the banning of fur trapping, many of you remember the Project Bobcat, yay, many of us are involved with that, uh, and of course recently, and he'll be talking about that, uh, the issue of the Western Joshua trees. So uh, good morning, all, and apologies. I'm a little, uh, my voice is a little hoarse from um, a lot of uh, chanting in the streets in Los Angeles yesterday, where we played host to a, a wonderful young activist from Sweden. Um, and if you haven't seen him in the news, um, who's joined us to help call for an end to. Um, well, at least in California. You've already stopped it on the public lands, but as you've heard, it's still going on on private lands. Um, so I'm going to give a very quick whirlwind tour of how the Federal and State Endangered Species Act work, and then also show case studies of the desert tortoise and the Joshua tree, and then end with sort of thoughts going forward and how you all can help get involved in this process. So for the Native Species Act, one of the key things that has to happen is first the species has to be put onto the list um, to get protection, that's under section four. Once listed, part, the core of the ESA is section seven, which deals with federal actions, um, and only applies to federal actions. Section nine, which is the prohibition on take, i.e. killing, um, applies to everyone. And then section 10 deals with getting permits. And the interplay of these is very relevant to what's happened to the desert tortoise. So very briefly, Section 7, every federal agency needs to ensure through a consultation process with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service that its actions do not jeopardize the continued existence of listed species or destroy or adversely modify its critical habitat. So this is the process part of the ESA that's most equivalent to, say, NEPA under federal law or um, CEQA under state law. So there's both a process, but also a substantive requirement. You cannot jeopardize. Um, out here in the desert, you know, a lot of our land is federal land. Pretty much everything BLM does is a federal action applies. It also applies to some private actions if there's a federal permit. Um, in much of the country, that's permits under the Clean Water Act. Out here in the desert, there aren't too many Clean Water Act permits because we don't have too many uh, waters of the U.S., but there's a few things, um, and all this hopefully will all circle around and make sense. Um, section 9, this is the take prohibition, and it's both direct take, i.e. shooting, killing, collecting, and an unintentional take, bulldozing a desert tortoise in his fur, so incidental take. Um, and that applies to everyone. It applies to us in this room, it applies to the town of Yucca Valley, it applies to state agencies, it applies to federal agencies. Um, importantly, it only applies to animals, not plants. Um, and there's a process for authorizing take, two processes. One is for federal agency actions through Section 7, um, which pretty regularly happens. And the second is through Section 10 for non-federal actions. <coughs> the California Endangered Species Act parallels the Federal Endangered Species Act in many ways, but differs. One of the most fundamental, and this is where I want you all to get involved later, is under federal law, the decisions are made by a, a theoretically scientific agency based here on science. Under state law, the scientific agency makes recommendations, but the actual decision is done by the California Fish and Game Commission through a public hearing process, and those are political appointees. Um, there are take prohibitions under both laws. Under CESA, there's no equivalent 
consultation provision for state agencies. Um, there's obligations that apply to state agencies, but not, not the process. Another really important difference is the citizen supervision. One of the strengths of the Endangered Species Act is that if you assume the federal agency is not going to enforce the law, it allows us to do it. We can sue a developer whose bulldozing habitat, um, uh, not just the federal agency. CESA has no such provision. So if a developer is bulldozing desert tortoise habitat, we cannot sue the developer, at least under CESA directly. But we might be able to sue the town that issued the building permit under a different provision. So there's workarounds, but it's it's a little harder to implement CESA. But a critical difference is CESA has better protection of plants. So the take provisions generally apply. It gets quickly very, very complicated. And at a later date, um, we'll get into that. So the desert tortoise. Two species of desert tortoise, a Mojave population and a Sonoran population. Um, the Mojave species has, is listed under um, both state and federal law. The Sonoran is a continuous battle to get it protected. Um, tortoise was ESA listed 1990, state listed 1989, 30 years ago. Um, once it was listed, that triggered numerous things, both the Section 7 obligations and the take prohibition. So state, federal, local agencies, the counties, all realized they needed to deal with it. Nevada, very quickly, got in the process, produced a habitat conservation plan, which has lots of flaws, but they actually did the process. In California, in the Mojave, in 92, they started this process. It took them years. In 2005, they produced a final environmental document saying, here it is, here's our plan. There were lots of issues, and agency infighting, and all sorts of problems with the county. And it was finalized in 06 as a BLM only plan, only government, federal lands. What that means is actually for the past 30 years, all the take, the killing of tortoises by bulldozing their habitat has been unpermitted and unlawful. And unfortunately, our state and federal aid wildlife agencies have not enforced it. So we'll circle back to that in a bit. The Joshua Tree. Um, this has been in the news a fair bit recently. It's primarily threatened by climate change, but in our area also loss of habitat and wildfire. Um, there was a federal petition for the species by another organization four years ago, which was recently denied. Um, but one of the things that came out of that process was clarity that there are in fact two species of Joshua Tree. And I'll show you a map in a moment. And based upon that, I worked on a petition which we filed last month to get the western species listed under state law. So this shows the range of the Joshua Tree across four states. The blue areas are not blue. The green is the western Joshua Tree. In that, I'm not sure if there's a pointer on this. There. Um, the green areas is the western Joshua Tree. You can see the salt sea down in the corner. The little um, part pointing down to the well, the east, uh, southeast is Joshua Tree National Park. So it's sort of this boomerang shape range across the is a 
study that came out this year in um, studying Joshua trees in our area, Joshua Tree National Park. Um, the, this area here is the current distribution of Joshua trees in the park. Under even relatively optimistic scenarios, assuming we comply with the Paris Agreement and climate targets and the world does some stuff to address climate change, under that scenario, we still lose two-thirds, three-quarters of our Joshua trees um, due to the warming. Um, under mid-range scenarios, we lose 80 plus percent. And under current trajectory, we lose well over 99 percent. The only place that the modeling shows that they still exist in their current range would be um, in the area of Eureka Peak, here in the Valley of the Park. Um, an additional threat to Joshua trees, particularly in the western Mojave, is fire. And fire used to be relatively rare in, in the Mojave until the proliferation of non-native grasses, which carry much bigger, more intense fires. And um, those grasses, in part, are fertilized by nitrogen that comes from LA smog, tailpipes, and power plants. And you can see there's just an intense concentration of fires um, in the range of the Joshua Tree over the past 20 years. And you know, most of these are human caused. You can sort of see I-15 and I-40 by the fire patterns. Um, so that double threat. And then for the western Joshua Tree in particular, about 40% of its habitat is on private land, which is subject to minimal um, environmental so last month, um, I did a, a petition to list the Joshua Tree under state law, the Western Joshua Tree. Um, it's on our website if you want to read a, you know, 80 page manifesto on everything you want to know about Joshua Trees, um, the laws regulating them, as well as the climate science, you can download it and read it. Um, and this starts a process that um, will go before the Fishing Game Commission. Um, They'll officially receive it at their December meeting, and it'll either be at their April meeting um, in Sacramento, more likely at their June meeting, which is in Santa Ana, that they will make an initial decision to advance the petition along. And if they do that, and we can clear that hurdle, um, the take prohibition starts to apply to Joshua Trees. And it will be a pretty interesting scenario. If this species is protected under CESA, it will be the first wide-ranging plant that's relatively abundant protected under that statute because the threat is undeniable uh, climate change impacts on the species. But most species plants listed under either federal or state ESA are pretty narrow endemics, and so you can often just mark off, don't bulldoze the 10 acres of habitat or stay out of the striparian zone, and you're roughly protecting them. So how do you protect Joshua trees will be a really, really interesting fight. Um, and one of the important things, I think, that's a difference here if we successfully pull this off, for those of us who live in this area, we've seen desert tortoise habitat eaten away one acre, five acres, ten acres at a time with very little to do about it because the developer can always say, we didn't find any tortoises on site. Um, they're relatively cryptic, and when they're in private land, you, you don't know if there's a desert tortoise on that parcel that's just being bulldozed or not. It's a lot harder to hide a Joshua tree. <laughs> um, and so, over the coming year, we're going to launch a project of trying to document the loss of Joshua trees using both mapping techniques, aerial imagery, to document all the past loss. Also looking at all the permitting from the county, from Delta Valley, and elsewhere, under various provisions that are supposed to um, protect them to some degree. And as you heard about the LA case, that mismatch between what's going on in the planning documents can lead to something um, significant. So what we're going to try to do, and hopefully convene a meeting probably early next year, locally, to try to lay out a plan to collect data to document the loss of Joshua Trees, the violation various planning statutes that will buttress our case for getting them listed, um, as well as the, the groundwork for hopefully significant litigation that can change how things are happening together and how habitat is being lost. And one of the end 
endgames here is to force the counties and local jurisdictions in the Mahab to enter a permitting process and actually get authorization for the take that's going to occur, but in a way that's lawful, documented, and mitigated so that we can actually, you know, block off, sorry, no development in these connectivity areas, no development in these areas that are mapped as refugia for Joshua trees. In these infill areas that developments can occur, it has to be mitigated with money put into funds to buy up the other properties and things of that sort. And so that's sort of the end game of all of this is to, by creating this crunch of, you have to stop killing Joshua trees until you have a plan that actually protects them, which most important thing is kill none or as few as possible. Um, hopefully that will transform by these plan.